Okay, thanks. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks, Tony. Hi. All right. Um, I won't bore you with the background with me too much, but yes, I've done a bit of this and I've talked at a few places and I think Charles and I were trying to work out how many conferences we've crossed paths at, which is somewhere almost in the double figures mark in the last five or six years. Um, so this is fun. And for me, this is a, a talk. Um, so I don't know whether any of you have done your homework about me. Um, um, Mondata is a company of mine that specializes in doing OS X packages. That's what we do. That's all we do. Um, and I don't normally talk about this in a public forum. So this is the first time in almost six years, I think, that I'm going to do, um, well, a talk of sorts that I've done before. Anyway, um, I'll start with a little bit of background as to how we started and why we did this. And this goes all the way back to 10.0. I got really, really frustrated with the OS installers um, and update patches requiring a restart, and you weren't able to queue installs back in 10.0. So it was one restart, or one install, one restart, one install, one restart. And I thought, there's got to be a better way to do this. And so I started to have a look at the way the package was put together, and I pulled them apart and realized that you could create the, like the OS had multiple packages, so why couldn't I just do that? So I was just editing all of the updaters, queuing them, putting them all in one place, and then having one install, one restart. And that was to save me time. And that was what it was all about. So that sort of evolved over time and started throwing third-party apps in there for deploying environments really quickly because um, I hate to say it, but I don't believe in imaging at all <laughs> um, and haven't had for a, for a very long time. Um, so we started, I started rolling in third-party software and things like that, improving the process, making it a bit quicker and learning how it all worked. We've now, and that sort of turned into a commercial entity, and now we've been running for about six years. So I don't do transitions and, and all of that sort of stuff. My, my slide notes are more or less bullet points for me to remember what I'm supposed to be talking about. Um, in the last couple of years, I've actually been recording what's been happening at Mondata and how many things that we're doing. So we do software for about 270-odd vendors, um, which loosely equates to about 550 titles, I think. And it's just shy of 1,200 packages currently being maintained by us, um, which is a lot. Um, in 2014, when we had all of the updates and all of the bits and pieces go through, we did 3,000, 3,500, somewhere around that. Packages were created by us and delivered to customers, and they are the application cores and updates only. That discounts settings packages. Um, which contain license files for customers and things like that. We didn't track that statistic at the time. Um, we delivered around 11,000 packages to customers that year. So I have a unique perspective on this. I do it a lot. Um, and if you were to work out the averages from those numbers, you'd probably think that I look at maybe eight to 10 things a day, every day. Um, 2015, we're about halfway through the year and our stats are sort of matching up to what we had there. We're seeing a few less updates, so henceforth a few less deliveries and it's um, making things a little bit easier. Um, anyway, right into it, because I'm not here to promote my own company, I'm here to actually talk about packaging and the concepts we use and the techniques we use and the tricks we use that people may be able to take away and help themselves with. Um, so it, it comes down to where are your, your best practices. And I've seen a few other little slides and talks and notes and guides and things just trolling the web and having a look at it. Um, the, the, the ultimate goal, the holy grail, is to be able to install on any volume. Yay, that's good. But it's not always possible. Um, and we'll get into the technical details of that when I start breaking down the different types of workflows that you're going to see. Um, try and avoid changing things with pre- and post-tasking scripts. Um, it doesn't get tracked by the receipt, and particularly if you're doing things like that um, with Jamf, uh, with, with Casper, and you've indexed your packages for uninstall, and you've modified a whole bunch of stuff outside what the payload is, because it's only the payload gets it, that gets indexed and removed, you've still got changes sitting around in the system that you've got to undo. And if you're going to do heavy pre- and post-tasking, 
put little echo statements in your, your scripts so that it goes back out to the error log or the message log or what's going on in the, um, when the installation process happens. So if something goes wrong, you can actually find out what went wrong. It's always helpful. A lot of reference materials. Um, the, the really official ones, uh, effectively the Apple ones, if rather than try and copy down these great big huge long URLs, I was a bit too lazy to do tiny URLs to make it easy for everyone. Um, but the main headers of these things, just Google those, they will be the first hits in the list. Um, they usually are. So um, Apple have a, a couple of really good guides around particularly the XML schema reference for the distribution file, which basically controls the entire behavior of the package. This is very, very useful to you. Um, the installer JavaScript reference is, well, languages that suck. JavaScript is one of those um, because you can do some really weird and wonderful things with JavaScript. But the, the updated XML um, schema reference and the updated XML in what's called a version 2 package, uh, which is what the App Store uses, is really good. It's got some additional tags in it that I'll dive into that I find incredibly useful for... Um, for just defining things that we had to do in JavaScript previously. And there is also a um, software delivery legacy guide out there when you're dealing with old things that you want to wrap up into a new format and stuff. And that's always good to read and try and figure out what someone was actually thinking when they did it in the first place. Um, diving right through it. I'm going to go fast too, by the way. You might have to play this back in slow motion later. Um, <laughs> but the distribution. Um, so the distribution is the main wrapper. This is the thing, it's not always there. So if you have a look at the OS installer, you will find that there is an OS install.mpkg, which is a meta package. That actually has a distribution in it that references all of the other things externally. Those external things are just simple, flat packages. They're dumb. They only have their descriptor. They don't have any checks and balances and anything around it in the background. But the, um, the main things I find useful in the distribution um, outside of the guide, because the guide doesn't really define the syntax very well. Um, and these, there are no real tools for implementing these features. Uh, if, uh, when I get to the workflows, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but the OS version tag, previously you had to do a JavaScript, read in a plist, pull a bundle in by ID, do a string comparison, get your version identifier, come back, you know, we're all good, good to go, happy, met requirements. Now it's got this lovely little thing in here that we can see is OS version minimum 10.84. So that is 10.84 unless we're running OS 10.10. OS 10, 10.10. So once we're running 10.10, .10, um, that invalidates everything in the 10.9 range for us. So we can go 10, 10.84, 10.85, invalidates 10.9, and install on 10.10 only. So you can actually have ranges of OSs in there. And it's a fairly simple syntax, and there's a whole lot less than having conditional JavaScript statements and big, big blocks of code that will check and invalidate your installer. Um, the other one I find is sort of useful um, and can come in handy, but it only really works when you're working inside the UI. So if you're using a management tool like Absolute Manage or Casper or anything along those lines, um, the must close tag finds an application by its bundle identifier regardless of its location, checks to see if it's running, and then interacts with the user and tells them to close the application. So the installation proceeds. That's nice and logical. When you're doing a command line install, that gets ignored. Every management tool does a command line install. We have a way to deal with that. <laughs> Um, required bundles is another one which is great for doing upgrades. So you might be upgrading an application in place or applying a small level patch to it, but you need to know that the application exists beforehand. Now, the mechanism of doing it by path to application, you know, like file exists and all of those things that you can do in JavaScript, um, isn't always reliable because users can move things and we have to account for that. Um, and so this one looks starting at a place with a bundle version, find what I'm looking for. You can do a um, search validator on that, but I didn't quite have enough room to put that in there, and we rarely do it at the moment because we just simply replace everything holus bolus. It seems to be a little bit safer. Um, the selections component of the package, previously there was just basically um, start selected, start enabled, so whether or not the user can actually check the box, whether or not it is actually checked to start with, um, and then, you know, force mandatory selection and do script evaluations around that. Um, there's another little lovely thing that we've got here, um, which is the active tag. 
So you can make something inactive based on the presence of a bundle. Very, very, very good to do. So you can actually just switch off the, the ability to install with a simple bundle check that the OS handles for you rather than scripting things with JavaScript and all of that sort of fun stuff. Um, and relocate. You find an old version, but the user may want the old version. So you can locate the bundle by IT, ID and you can just dump it into an old folder. Uh, the, that sort of appeared when, I believe I first saw that when we were dealing with iMovie at one point in time because there was the iMovie HD and then that got moved to a previous iMovie folder or a previous versions folder and that sort of stuff. So that's, that's also very useful. These are the things that you need to dig into the guide, the, the XML reference and have a really good look at because there are some interesting tidbits in there that you can do. There are other things like RAM checks, available disk space checks and all of those things and the, the syntax is very simple. Once you see a couple of examples, you sort of understand how it all works. Plugins. Um, so I had my first experience with actually writing a proper plugin um, a few weeks back and I believe the people I wrote it for are in the audience. So this was to capture intangible stuff that wasn't able to be captured programmatically from the computer, like the asset tag. So you have someone enrolling your computer into Casper and you want to record the asset tag. So writing an installer plugin that you could punch in some information, it would then basically in the background submit that to the, um, the JSS using the API and pre-create a computer record, which it would then update when the computer enrolled. It was nice and easy, but don't make plugins a showstopper if you're doing unattended installs. So it's good for serial numbers, it's good for all of that sort of stuff. But if you make it a showstopper, your installation is going to fail. So you need to be able to get through that ability and have the, um, sorry, get through that step and have the ability to update it later. It's just useful on occasion. Um, there is a reference example, um, an Xcode example, which you have to tune a little bit um, in Apple's sort of legacy software division. You can download the sample thing, open the project in Xcode, and it will actually tell you where all of the problems are in it because, well, it was written for 10.4 and we're now about six versions of the OS later than that. Um, but it was, it was fairly straightforward to walk through that process, figure out how it was doing what it was doing, add a few extra bits of code in there to actually hook into the, um, the API for the JSS and, and away we went. Um, it was an interesting learning experience for me. It was also very intense because there were time constraints. Right, into the packages themselves. There are some common components. There is the BOM file. Um, Previously, in the old bundle package format, it was called archived, uh, yeah, archive.bom. So it stands for bill of materials. What's in the payload itself? Um, the archive, which is called payload in a flat package and was called uh, archive.pax.gz in the old bundles packages. Um, so that contains the actual file. So the bill of materials tells you what's in the archive, what permissions are there, where they go, all that sort of stuff, complete tree structure. Flat packages have a package info file, which is an XML descriptor, which actually can, doesn't have to, but can contain information about the bundles that you are updating as part of that installation. So you can make that little descriptor that the installer and the OS will handle figuring out whether or not they exist and doing the upgrades in place regardless of where you've chosen to install the package. So this is kind of handy. When someone takes an application out of the applications folder and throws it in their desktop and you're doing a managed environment, you push the patch out through your management suite, it will then just go off and find it on their desktop and update it there. That's nice. I like that. Um, and then it has a scripts directory which contains, um, there are two, basically two script names for a flat package, pre-install, post-install. Um, when I talk about the old school bundles, um, yes, there we are. The XML, um, sorry, the package info XML file is a, it's just a standard property list. Uh, it's an info P list that tells you a little bit about the package, not a lot, just versioning, identifier string, some other bits and pieces, you know, minimum system requirement. There's very little you can do in there. And then it contains um, scripts and extras. So in the old bundle package that there was installation check, volume check, Pre-install, post-install, pre-upgrade, post-upgrade, pre-flight, and post-flight. That was ugly. 
because they had a specific sequence and if it detected the existence of a bundle beforehand, it would run pre-upgrade rather than pre-install and it got a little bit messy. That's a lot nicer in a flat package. Um, so that's that. I don't particularly think much of bundles and I don't use them anymore. All right. Um, so a lot of tools are out there. Um, and this was interesting for me because we've actually written our own tools and been using them for about two years now. So I had to learn how to use these again last week. <laughs> um, and it was, it was good. And it sort of it gave me a little bit of perspective. Iceberg uh, is effectively an old bundle package creator, and that was far superior to Apple's pack package maker. That was a really, really good tool. And when we started out, we were using that a lot. Um, the, the author has written a, a, a sort of an updated version of that, creates flat packages, um, which is called Packages, which is actually a great tool if you're learning this. It's really easy. It's a guided workflow. It doesn't really allow you to screw anything up, but it doesn't afford a great deal of flexibility. And I find when you're trying to do customized and conditional selections, it can get very confusing because you get these monster logical statements, which are you know, 20 or 30 conditions long. And that actually causes massive lags when the package is figuring out what it's going to do during installation. Jamf have Composer, which is very good for creating snapshot packages, but comes with a downside. Um, the, the default format for, for Jamf is a DMG, which limits you to pre and post tasking. So you have to write your scripts externally and then punch them into your management suite and deliver those as a separate entity or a part of a policy that puts the DMG down. Really good for indexing, really good for uninstall, all of those sort of things. Um, but once again, it makes it difficult to do interesting tasks, shall we say. <laughs> um, Adobe. Let's talk about things that suck, shall we? <laughs> um, now, I could have probably done about four hours on this and not even scratched the surface with some of the quirks that we come across with the Adobe products, um, and in particular, their mass deployment tools. Right, so anyone here had a go at this? Yeah, anyone here still sane? <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, all right, so this is, this is probably gonna be the most valuable part of this entire presentation for everyone. So, Adobe had the Application Manager Enterprise Edition because you need to have a really long title and then a five letter acronym and it's a bloody mouthful to say and I hate it. Um, it was a reasonable tool to do what it did. Uh, there are things that I like about what that does and there are things that I do not like about what that does. Um, all of these tools from Adobe do not create a traditional package with a payload. They create a payload-free package and put the actual entire Adobe installer inside that as a pre or a post task. So it's a script. So they don't index. They don't uninstall very nicely. Fortunately, Adobe provide you with an uninstall mechanism. It generates an uninstall package, but there are some, some quirks with that as well. Basically, if um, there are certain Adobe titles that if you attempt to package them and create the uninstaller, the uninstaller simply doesn't work. Um, so there are, there are giveaways for what happens with that. Um, the concept of checking updates and grouping applications together and doing all sorts of other fun things, mm, hit and miss. Um, this evolved into the Creative Cloud Packager when Adobe went to Creative Cloud, and now we have different license selections and models and all sorts of other fun things that you can do, and they now have it mandatory if you're using a, um, sorry, actually, quick question, show of hands. Who's using a device-based license for Adobe products? Yeah. Um, has anyone got pullback working for the licenses yet? So if you assign a license to a device and then you attempt to pull it back, is it actually coming out of your console yet? So that's still broken. Good to know. Um, there's a classic thing. Uh, serial number licenses for Adobe? Yeah. And I see people who have both of those things already. Um, and Teams licenses. Yep. OK. And so, and I find a lot of organizations actually have a mix of all of these things. 
Um, so not only do you have to bundle up the applications, but you have to bundle up the licenses and you have to do different versions of the licenses. And this starts to get fairly messy at this point in time. Um, so, and CCP has different licensing models that show you different things when you do it. And um, this is the company that keeps us in business, effectively. <laughs> Um, this, is, this is what I deal with all the time. Um, so they also have a third tool, which is a little bit lesser known, which is the customization wizard. Uh, that is specifically for Acrobat. And it's for doing serial number deployments of Acrobat that don't uh, require an Adobe ID to sign in. On the Mac platform, that is actually broken at the moment. It craps itself when you attempt to generate the provisioning profile, which is the thing that licenses the product. If it doesn't have that, the installation creation fails. Even if you use their provisioning tool from the command line in the way it's supposed to be used, if you actually know the syntax and can find the reference manual for it and all of the fun stuff, um, it fails to generate the provisioning profile because it doesn't understand what to do with an Acrobat DC serial number yet. So I have no idea how they've released an Acrobat DC tool that doesn't understand the product that it's doing. Um, but these are the things we deal with. Um, so Apple have a bunch of tools. They're now no longer part of the developer tool suite. They're built into the OS. And these were the things that I relearned because these are the foundations for the tools that we wrote that we use internally. Um, if you've got a terminal open, just punch them in and have a look at them. They've all got man pages. The man pages don't have examples in them, which I find a little annoying. Um, but the common processes that you're going to find that you'll need to use. There's one called PKG Util. It has really two functions. You flatten the pack, sorry, you can flatten something and you can expand something. So if you find a package that you want to have a look inside of and see what it's using, PKG Util double dash expand, throw the package there, throw an, uh, like a path to where you want it to expand to. Note, in that line there where it says destination, that folder cannot exist. It creates it as part of the process. If you attempt to expand to a folder that exists, so the parent of that folder must exist, but the destination where you want to unpack the thing to cannot exist. It's a quirk, and it doesn't really tell you what the hell's going on. You just think it's broken. Um, and conversely, or inversely, um, you can flatten something. So you can take a folder that you've already unpacked and then just use the flatten tool to put it back together. This is really good if you've got something with an expired certificate that you still want to use from a vendor. So you can just unpack it and then repack it. Simple two-step process, and then suddenly you will have a flat package with no cert because it eliminates the certificate off it when you do this. This is useful. Um, but also good to know, because if you have a mandatory requirement for certificates, then you have to re-sign the package after you flatten it. Uh, PKG build. This will build a package like one of the OS installer subcomponents. So it's a flat package that does not have a distribution file. So it doesn't have its checks and balances and the prettiness of the distribution for the UI. Um, but it's a really simple tool to do because you can do, say, something like Firefox. Download it, mount the DMG, PKG build, double dash component, drag the Firefox application from the DMG into your terminal. If you want to put some pre and post scripting there, point it to a scripts directory. You can leave that out. doesn't have to be there. Give it an example, org.mozilla.firefox.pkg. Give it a version string. Tell, you where, tell it where you want to put it. If you don't tell it anything, it'll just automatically put it in applications for you. Um, you can tell it to do OS level recommended ownership, which is great, because then you don't have to think about permissions. It'll just set them all correctly as part of that process. And then path to where you want to dump the package out. And you're done. And that process for Firefox takes about 12 seconds. So it's a fairly nice, useful little thing. Um, product build, a little bit more complex. So what this does is it builds that flat package, but it puts a distribution wrapper around it as well with some requirements checks and other bits and pieces. This is what's actually used to do all the App Store packages. So they use the product build tool to do it. Um, it interpolates a lot of things. And more often than not, it will leave things out like the title. <laughs> so that's not so great, but it can be useful. So um, the, the tools we, we developed internally use a, a mix of those two functions themselves. And they're very sort of really good when you can put them together. Because you could use PKG build and build your package accurately with all of the little flags and the extra scripts and other bits and pieces. Use product build, and it'll generate you a template distribution file that you can then edit. And then you can use PKG util and just sort of 
basically create your directory structure, put all the other bits and pieces in it that you need, and then flatten it out, and you're done. And it's a nice, quick, easy, simple process. And given that all of the tools live in the OS, you can quite easily script that and just tell it to do a sequence of events to build them. Product sign is the last one. Um, once again, the syntax for that is a little bit interesting. You have to very concisely define your certificate. And you have to put it inside quotes and do all sorts of other fun stuff. Um, and it will basically path to an unsigned package, path to a signed package. It will just attach the digital signature to it and spit it out at the tail end. Right, some workflows. I've got 14 minutes to go, and I may get to do a couple of little show-off bits at the tail end. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so payload-free packages. These are kind of what people use for doing settings, scripting, Adobe installers. Um, I do these for Autodesk products because they have their own proprietary installer that tends to want some information and other bits and pieces, so that's fine. So the payload free package is, is really good if you want to just deliver something where you want to change something to the system, and an easy mechanism for delivering that is with a PKG. Nice, we got that. Drag and drop single applications, that's where your product build and your PKG build and all of those things, they come in very, very handy. Um, you can point um, product build to a folder, which is useful because then you can deliver a folder into the applications folder. Uh, that doesn't work with the, um, the PKG build. That needs to be pointed directly at an app. Um, things that are in, already in a PKG form. So we do a lot of these. And I sort of had an aha moment a few years ago where I realized that there was no point in completely unpacking everything and all of the payloads and then reassembling it all and doing that. Um, just leave the, the, the BOM file and the payload intact and update your pre and post tasks or your distribution. That's fairly much all that we do around that because our goal is to deliver as close as possible to what the vendor does. So it's um, an interesting trick. So you'll find that there are some things, um, uh, I saw a good one with AM, oh, sorry, no, not AM. Someone was attempting to do an install using the root account in user land. And the Office installer, actually the, the vendor, um, installer from Microsoft actually breaks if you're logged in with the root user and you attempt to install. It has a complete and utter shit fit and we had no idea what was going on until I figured out that they were actually logged in with the root account. It's a little better from the command line but still throws a bunch of errors um, because it does a sudo dash u user command. So you try sudo dash u user root, hmm, it's not going to end well. Um, the other thing that we find that we're doing a lot of with things that are already in a PKG form is a bundle package. So taking those and, and making them flat. Um, so we've, we've still got the archive, we've still got the BOM, we can see what their pre and post tasks were and we can just completely restructure everything and put it back together from a bundle to a flat package. And then in some rare cases, it is a complete repackage. You've got to take the whole thing apart, create the payload, create a route, put the project back together and, and then spit another package out at the tail end. Um, I mentioned this before, third-party installers. So if you can install the, call the installer via the CLI um, and deliver, like, deliver the installer the way the vendor intended without actually having to completely unpack it or repack it or do a snapshot, you'll find that that is actually far less problematic than creating snapshots because a lot of the things that use what I call the archaic mechanism of doing things, which is a third-party installer or an in-house installer. Um, I mean, Autodesk wrote their own installer engine in Python that has an app GUI wrapper around it that then calls a PKG that it installs after it does some pre-tasking. Why? Why would you do that? Um, and the Autodesk products are not snapshotable because they use the machine's UUID to do their licensing. So they're completely and utterly unfun. Um, so figuring out how to do that, or actually how to use their installer and what the Python application was doing was a, um, a big deal for us because we worked out that we could actually lay the settings down first as part of the process and then call the installer from the command line if the file was in the right place and it just worked. So yay, that worked. Um, Adobe, we have a, an entire 
mode of operation that's dedicated to Adobe products. We use the CCP tools, we download all of the stuff, we generate the things, and then we take them all apart and we put them back together our way. And that works for us, and it works really, really well. And I'll um, talk about that. Some gotchas with these things. Snapshots. Be careful when you're snapshotting. Do not snapshot things that you should, or do not include things that are probably not part of the package. Less is more in this scenario when you're testing. Stick with the, the very finer points, like what you can directly identify to the application. Um, once it starts modifying things outside of its own bounds, or once you think it's modifying things out of its own bounds, then you should start to think about scripting that, because you don't want to stomp something that the system changes as well. That's never a good thing. You can brick log in Windows. You can do all sorts of fun, other fun stuff. I think I've had a talk to Charles about this sort of thing happening before. Someone replacing login window.plist with something they snapshotted. Um, didn't end well. Plugins. Um, be careful with those as well. Like a lot of the time, you'll find that the application will still deliver if you remove an existing plugin that asks for a serial number. So if you take a flat package, you unpackage, you take the the the, um, the plugin out that serializes it. You can then do the install. The the software most likely won't license, but you can then just capture those settings with a snapshot, or you can do a script that will license the software for you, um, which is a really nifty little way of doing things. So you keep the vendor's package basically intact. Um, you just remove the thing that was the showstopper, you get through it, and then you apply your license key later. Easy. Um, and calling third-party installers can be a little bit dangerous on occasion. I've seen one or two that were asynchronous. So they would kick back a success message before they'd even finished doing what they were doing. Ouch. So really what we do and these are the, the things that I've just found work really, really well for us as an organization. But we are unique because we have a lot of customers. A lot of them use the same titles. And the way we work is based on deduplication of effort. How do we do something once, one time? And this can actually be applicable to your environment as well. Because, um, yeah, Adobe. Let's talk about things that suck. Um, so the, the Amy, I said there were some things I liked about Amy. The Amy mechanism, it had two panes. One, you selected your application after you got your media kit, so you could select all of the applications or all of the components of the application that you wanted, and then it would give you the option to select the updaters, and it had the updaters in what are called channels. Um, so each Adobe product has a channel ID, and then they have different update streams and things like that. Some things don't have a channel ID, so they pair with the parent that installed them, and they're usually throwaway kind of components or little things that don't matter. They're not hugely impacting. Um, one of the things that we've sort of been spending a lot of time on this year is figuring out how to apply that model to the CCP tool for two reasons. One, one application, one package. That is a very smart way to do things because the applications more and more are becoming on a different or are coming on a different release cycle. And not always do Adobe update every single application when they do the release in the middle of the year, which is what we're working through at the moment. Um, if you have them busted up into their individual titles, it seems like more work, but it's not in the long run. Initially it is, but three months in, it has saved you a lot of time. Then, we were doing complete roll-ups, every update that was suitable for that application. Then we looked at what Camera Raw was doing to us. So Camera Raw affects 14 applications. So one update from Adobe equaled 14 packages for us. That was not good. So Camera Raw is in its own update channel back in Amy. So we've started modeling everything on the Amy model rather than what CCP is telling us to do. We reduced our number of updates, I think it was from 126 down to less than 80. So it cut a third of our workload out by a very simple little decision. Um, the other thing is, we don't put our updates in our baseline installers anymore. We were doing it for a while and we stopped. Now, install, get your app core down, updates. Does it have that original package? Then patch it up to the latest version. You've got those two things separated you'll find that your workflows get a lot easier because 
you don't want to be pushing, particularly if you've got multiple apps in your original package and one update comes out and then you've got to regenerate an entire great big huge Adobe package for your original baseline install, it gets ugly. It gets really ugly really quickly. Um, and then we have our settings packages. So things that are individual to the customer. So basically everybody gets the install and the update. The settings go out to people who want them. They contain their licensing info. They contain their, um, any custom preferences that they want. Now I'm not really sort of, um, not really hugely excited about setting preferences using a package. You have management tools to deploy the software. Use the management tool to set the preferences. It is a better way to do it. And in particular, use a profile. Um, the other thing that we do is we keep our scripts modular. So our scripts directory have basically a pre-install and a post-install script in them. And then they have an actions directory for each of those. Now, this is not new. If you pull an Apple package apart, you will find that they have those in there. And then we have the scripts set up to sequentially run in the order they need to run in the pre and post actions. That way, if we need to change one thing, we don't have to change everything. And a lot of these, sort of the pre and post tasks are common. They get used across multiple products. So they can be reinserted and moved and things like that. And from a development perspective, it lightened our workload to have those checked in and checked out and updated and so the, the common changes made it easily. Um, rather than having to maintain every time we made a change to one thing, if it affected multiple products, we would then have to go and do you know, 150 changes and that's just really counterproductive as well. Um, when we deal with packages that deal with user space, this is always a fun thing. If it has to do something on behalf of the user, um, there are quite a few things out there that do this very silently in the background. We've sort of been working in and out of this. We have had um, some really interesting experiences with it, but we've, um, we've kind of got it down to a reasonably fine art. Check Discal. Is it a mobile account? Is it a local account? Does it have an authentication authority? Does it have a home directory? Is the home directory visible? If it, all of those things are met, then execute it on behalf of that user in turn until we like, just populates an array with user accounts and then does it for every user. And then does the user template so the next person who logs in gets it, yay. That's the basic mode of operation. Um, we were scanning for home directories in the users folder and then we realized that not every home directory was in the users folder. We were scanning for plists in the, like, uh, what is it, var, db, ds, local, nodes, default, users, find those, read the plist. That was ugly. Disk was really easy. Um, it's got offline mode, so you can actually use it to a targeted disk. Um, so that's all very well documented. Handling running apps. Um, this is a sort of a, a bit of a contentious thing for us because we really think that it's kind of not our responsibility, but it sort of is, and it's, it's a gray area. Um, so we wrote an application and we put it in as a pre-install task. So instead of having the must close tag in the distribution, the pre-install task invokes the application, checks to see if the application is running, and then asks the user to quit it. Um, we're moving on porting that out into the notification framework, thanks to Daniel over there who pointed out a, a little sort of usage of Swift to me that I thought was pretty cool. I then pulled it apart and then took it back to Objective-C because I need to do it in 10.8 and Swift doesn't work in 10.8 and it's all sorts of fun. Um, and we're finding that that is actually really, really successful. Uh, an interactive notification for the user that's persistent comes up on the screen, asks them to close the app. If you hit the button that says quit, it will attempt to quit the app. If there's unsafe work, it will then take you to the app to then save your work and quit. It's quite nifty. If there's nothing going on in the app, it just quits. <laughs> um, easy. Signing packages. Um, this was a fun one for us because legally we can't sign something that is unsigned. So if the payload is unsigned, we can't sign the package. And that's a legal thing. And that's going to get very interesting come later this year. But I think it's the way Apple want everything to change. They want every app signed, so it shouldn't be our problem anymore. Um, so our roadmap, I want to move the little app, the warning thing, out to the notification framework, which is nearly done. And we're starting to work on doing provisioning profiles that we bundle with the packages when we give them to the customers. So rather than having the settings in the package, which deliver it one time to the user, and then the user can go and change and make a mess of everything anyway, so um, to provide our customers with provisioning profiles instead. 
um, which I think is a far smarter way of doing it. Anyway, I have actually run over time. It took me longer than I thought to get through this. Um, thanks, everyone. Do we have any questions? Do we have time to answer any questions? Can I have? Probably not, but we're not letting you escape. So. Anyone? Anything? No? Well-behaved crowd. Well -behaved crowd. <laughs> Did I scare people again? <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.